Jesus said, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have come not to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Whoever then relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so, shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But he who does them and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother shall be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, shall be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Make friends quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest the accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out till you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, makes her an adulteress, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again you have heard that it was said to the men of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, Do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. This teaching of Jesus is a continuation of his great Sermon on the Mount, where he's speaking, us, speaking to us about living for God's kingdom. And it's in this part of his teaching where he kind of brings to himself many enemies. Some of the things he says here gives great opposition to what the spirit of the world wants people to know. But there's one thing Jesus says that really leads to his crucifixion. He says in this teaching that we cannot kill, we cannot commit adultery. And then he says, but I say to you. And he's giving us a deeper meaning to the commandments. But when he keeps saying, but I say to you, he's putting himself on the same level as God. And that's one of the charges that the Pharisees and scribes and the sinners put against him that lead to his crucifixion. Jesus is giving us a lesson about eternity. He teaches us that eternity is very important. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Eternity is so important. Jesus speaks about heaven and hell. Now we don't, most of the time we don't think about eternity. We think most of the time about what we're doing now in this world. But eternity is real. Jesus teaches us that we have to live for eternity. We cannot kill, that's the fifth commandment. But Jesus tells us more, that we cannot be angry or hateful towards someone. We cannot commit adultery, that's commandment number six. We know that, but now he's telling us we cannot have lust within our hearts. 
Here Jesus is teaching us that not only can't we do this or that sin, but we cannot even have bad desires. We can't desire this or that sin. You know, if you said to someone, you can desire this kind of sin all you want, just don't do it. Well, what you put in, them, in their lives is a very great frustration. You're saying, in a sense, you can go north and south at the same time. You can't do that. Jesus wants us to belong completely to God. He's teaching us that we have to want holiness. We have to repent of bad desires. Actually, when we go to confession, not only do we confess our sinful actions and words and deeds, but we also have to confess our sinful desires. We have to turn away from them, embrace holiness. This teaching of Jesus causes great sort of opposition. People are opposed to it. He's put himself on the level of God, and he's telling us that the commandments must reach more deeply into our life. The righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and all the hypocrites was a righteousness based on externals only. Um, they had the appearance of religion, even more the robes of religion, but their hearts were far from God. They were among the corrupt. It's one thing to be a sinner. It's another thing to be corrupt. This is something that Pope Francis has talked about repeatedly. Um, everyone's a sinner. But people who are corrupt are those who get in their positions of authority in religion and no longer care about their relationship to God. That's what Jesus is condemning. Our righteousness must surpass that. Not only can we avoid this or that sin, we must not desire sin. Desire is something that really only ourselves and God knows about. And so if we desire sin, we're moving against the Lord. In his teaching, Jesus is teaching us that sin is real. And whatever causes us to sin, we must avoid. When he says that if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out, or when your hand causes sin to cut it off, he's not speaking literally here, but he's teaching us to avoid the occasion of sin. In one of the acts of contrition, when we make our confession in the sacrament of penance, we make a little prayer of contrition. In one of the versions of this prayer, we pledge to avoid the occasion of sin, a situation that will lead me to sin I have to avoid that as well. If I don't avoid the occasion of sin, you know what that means? It means that I want the sin. And we can't do that. We can't want sin. This teaching of Jesus is very serious because the consequences are eternal. People don't like to hear this. They don't want to think about eternity, about judgment, about heaven and hell. But it's real. We could deny the reality of sin all we want. We could deny the existence of heaven and hell all we want, but it won't change reality. All this is very, very real. St. Paul, in one of his letters, talks about the teaching of Jesus as a wisdom that is not of this age, a wisdom that's not of this world. The teaching of Jesus is not of this world, and that's why it's opposed. In his life, his teaching was opposed. He was crucified. This is the case in the lives of the apostles and the martyrs and the saints. Because they embrace Christ in the teachings of the church, they encounter opposition. The teaching of Christ is not of this world, so it is ridiculed, marginalized, and ignored. It happens today all over the place. Even within the church, there will exist a temptation to doubt the wisdom of God's truth, to question, is what Jesus teaches really true and is it good for us? Even with our, within our own hearts, we will experience from time to time a very intense battle between the wisdom of Christ and the wisdom of the world. St. Paul in his letter about the wisdom that is not of this age is telling us elsewhere in the letter that it's a sign of maturity to accept the wisdom of the Lord Jesus. In life, we rejoice when there's progress, when we feel we are maturing, when we mature physically or emotionally or intellectually or we mature in whatever profession we're involved in. We feel that's a good sign of progress. But we have to mature spiritually as well. That's most important. Our relationship to God must be something we always grow in. God is eternal. His truth, His grace, His love, and His light is eternal. And we can never plumb the depths of God's life. We can always grow in our relationship to the Lord. So we have to, if we're not growing in it, 
we are moving away from Him. We have to mature spiritually. It's a good question to ask. Are you more mature spiritually than you were a year ago? If not, get to it. Get to more following of Jesus Christ. We must allow ourselves to grow towards spiritual maturity. And we do this by accepting and living the teaching of Jesus. Start with the gospel I just read to you. Live that and you will mature spiritually. In this regard, humility is so necessary. Humility is so important because it leads us to accept God's Word and to obey it. Jesus says in the Gospel that our yes must be simply yes and our no must be simply no. Anything more than that is from the devil. Humility leads us to say yes to Christ and to His teaching. We don't want to say yes to Him and then begin to question it. We say yes to Christ and no to the false wisdom, the lies of the spirit of this age. Dear brothers and sisters, let your yes be simply yes and your no be simply no. Let us begin again living our yes to the Lord Jesus. This is how we shall belong completely to the Lord who loves us and who lives and reigns forever. God bless you.